Welcome to the Seminole Wars. In this podcast, we explore how the Seminole Wars came to be, how they were fought, and how they still resonate some two centuries later. I am your host, Patrick Swan, and our show is a production of the Seminole Wars Foundation, found online at www.seminolewars.us. We are recording today from the homestead of the Foundation in Bushnell, Florida. Thank you for listening. Hello and welcome. In late August 1813, the Creek Nation was engaged in a civil war between the so-called Red Stick faction that wanted to return the traditional Creek ways and the White Sticks who favored integrating with European and American ways. Whites, in feeling threatened by the Creek War, they sought protection. Territorial militia arrived and promptly created a conflict rather than prevented one. They attacked Creeks at their midday meal at a place called Burnt Corn Creek. In retaliation, on August 30th, 1813, the Creeks gathered a war party and attacked Fort Mims in Lower Alabama, just north of Mobile, when the fort's dinner bell rang. This battle and the war between the United States and the Red Stick faction led to a string of conflicts between Americans and the existing Indian populations in the southeast, including Florida. The Fort Mims battle was one piece in a conflict that ran roughly from 1812 until 1858, when the Second Seminole War ended. After the Americans retaliated and defeated the Red Sticks at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, Red Stick faction refugees migrated to Spanish Florida, where they integrated with the Miccosukee and Seminole tribes. One of those refugees was a youth called Billy Pal, or, as our listeners well know, Osceola. He would carry memories hearing about this battle and this war. His great uncle, Peter McQueen, was a key leader in it. How the Red Sticks fought would inform Osceola's actions in the Second Seminole War, more than two decades later. The Battle of Fort Mims, or the Fort Mims Massacre, is reenacted as spectacle August 29th and 30th this year, as it is every year, at Tensaw, Alabama, where a reconstructed Fort Mims stands. Southern writer, historian, and Creek Indian reenactor Dale Cox joins us to narrate and explain the tale. Hailing from the quaint little community of Two Egg, Florida, Dale has authored or co-authored more than one dozen books on Southern history and culture. Of interest to listeners is his most recent focus on the Creek and Seminole Wars in Florida, Georgia, and Alabama. These include the first two volumes in a four-book series, Fort Gaines, Georgia, A Military History, and Fort Scott, Fort Hughes, and Camp Recovery, three 19th century military sites in southwest Georgia. He has done pioneering research on the Negro Fort at Prospect Bluff, for which he publishes findings, and he has authored a biography of Millie Francis, the Creek Pocahontas. He's also written about Fowltown, the first battle of the Seminole Wars. With Rachel Conrad, Dale Cox founded Two Egg TV, which produces short, entertaining historical documentaries about these early 19th century events in the Lower American Southeast. Two Egg TV features scenic outdoor locations, historic sites, legends, live events, and more. Although many of their stories end up on commercial television throughout the world, our listeners can find them on YouTube and from their website, twoeggtv.com. Dale Cox, welcome to the Seminole Wars. Hello, how are you? All is well, Dale. What makes the Battle of Fort Mims significant in history? Well, Fort Mims is highly significant because it really was the catalyst or the event that led not just to the two Creek Wars, but to the Trail of Tears, to the Seminole Wars, and really to Indian removal itself in the entire southeastern United States. Why was there a battle at Fort Mims? Fort Mims was a retaliation by the Red Stick faction of the Creeks for an attack that took place against them by a force of Mississippi volunteers at a place called Burnt Corn Creek. And as a result of this retaliatory strike by the Red Sticks, the fort was taken and somewhere between 200 and 300, we'll say 250 of the inhabitants of the fort died in the attack and the fort was largely destroyed and that led to a really outpouring of rage across the white settlements of the southeast and three armies invaded the creek territory in what is today alabama georgia and to some degree florida it took place on august 30th 1813 why did the Army build Fort Mims? Fort Mims was built when a civil war erupted in the Creek Nation. What was the approximate cause of the Creek Civil War? 
in the late 1812, the Red Stick Movement began to rise in the Creek Nation, and it was led by a healer and a visionary named Josiah Francis. He was a prophet, and he had established a town called Econochaco, which was on the Alabama River in today's Lowndes County, Alabama. And the prophet Francis had visions that unless Creek people, which included the Muscogee, as we know today, but also other factions or other bands or towers of the Creeks, including the Alabamas, the Cushadas, the Hachitis, the Uchi, and others, all unified unless they resisted further Anglo encroachments on their lands, unless they returned to their traditional ways, they were going to lose everything. So this was what he taught. This grew counter the beliefs of the big warrior who at that time was the leader of the Creek Council, the speaker of the Creek Council, the U.S. agent for Indian Affairs, Benjamin Hawkins, and others who were followers of the U.S. government's plan of civilization. When the Civil War erupted, there were fears along the frontier surrounding the Creek Nation that the fighting might spill over, and so a series of frontier stock aids were thrown up around different homes, one of those homes being the home of Samuel Mims in the Tinsaw settlement of Alabama, which is up above Mobile, and that became the Mims Fort or Stockade or, as we know it today, Fort Mims, and that's why it was built. Fort Mims is not that famous, certainly not as much as the Alamo in Texas. How does it compare to the Alamo? The death toll there was actually greater than at the Alamo. Part of that death toll was a group called the Matisse. Who were they, and what were they doing in the fort? The Matisse were a mixture of Native American and Anglo settlers who lived along the Alabama River region, the Tensaw settlements in Alabama, and for the Anglo settlers who lived in Alabama. It was much like the Alamo. It was a place where people fought to the death. Some escaped against red stick attackers, and to them, and it became known in history, came known as the Massacre of Fort Mims. Forgotten was the fact that these very same people had attacked the Red Sticks first, which is often the way history goes. It became known as one of these places where people were attacked and where they fought to the death, which is the way history records the Alamo. We often forget what happened first. And so that's the way Fort Mims came to be remembered. It's often forgotten that on July 27th, one month before, there was a previous battle that took place, but that's why it came to be remembered, and it's often forgotten why the Red Sticks attacked Fort Mims in the first place, but that's where that term came about, and that's why it came to be remembered that way. And just as was the case with the Alamo in Texas, where the Alamo led to the Battle of San Jacinto, where Sam Houston achieved victory over Santa Ana and Texas gained its independence. What happened from Fort Mims, it led to U.S. intervention in the Creek Civil War, which eventually led to the Battle of Horseshoe Bend and led to the Treaty of Fort Jackson, which led to the loss of more than 20 million acres of Native American lands in Alabama and Georgia. And white Americans saw the Battle of Horseshoe Bend as a retaliation for what they were calling the Fort Mims Massacre. Yes, it was. At least in the United States, it was seen as retaliation, as was a series of battles which took place following Fort Mims as three U.S. armies advanced into the Creek Territory. And again, it was very conveniently forgotten that Fort Mims itself was a retaliation for an unprovoked attack on a party of Red Sticks one month prior to the attack on Fort Mims. These things happened like dominoes falling. What was the composition of soldiers at Fort Mims? There were no regular troops at Fort Mims. This was not a regular U.S. Army post. This was a frontier stockade where a group of settlers had forded in, which is a term that everyone familiar with the Seminole Wars is well familiar with. It was a stockade thrown up around the home of Samuel Mims. There were some Mississippi territorial volunteers and militia there. At that time, the areas of Alabama, of what we know today as Alabama, that were not part of the Creek Nation were part of the Mississippi Territory. So there were, after the volunteers from the Mississippi Territory were defeated at Burncorn Creek, then they knew there was a governor of Mississippi Territory, and the officers there knew that there was going to be a retaliation. And so they did call out the militia, and they called out volunteers. They did station them at a series of posts across the frontier, and one of those posts was Fort Mims. General Ferdinand Claiborne had done some inspections in the area 
He had ordered the strengthening of Ford Mims by building a blockhouse there. The blockhouse was not completed yet. He had ordered some strengthening of the stockade, and he had sent a few over 100 Mississippi volunteers and militia there. Dale, was this outpost doomed, or what could they have done to defend better? Had the blockhouse been completed, had they followed the instructions for strengthening the post, had they even closed the gates, they probably could have held the post against the attack that was coming. But the commander there was not particularly concerned about a Native American attack. And so the gates were wide open on the day of the attack, and they just were not overly prepared for an attack. They paid the price in blood that day. When the Creek Civil War began, what were the U.S. government's greatest concerns? As was the case across the frontier, as the Creek Civil War had heated up, they were very concerned about the possibility of it spilling over. And there were rumors running wild that the Red Sticks planned to, as soon as they had finished off the big warrior and his forces in the Creek Nation, that the Prophet Francis and the Red Sticks planned to attack the frontiers. There's no evidence of this. In fact, there are some surviving documents that indicate that they did not, in fact, anticipate attacks against the U.S. frontiers. Their documented interviews with various Red Stick leaders indicate they told people in the Tensaw settlement that they were not planning to attack them, that they were simply taking care of a leadership situation in the Creek Nation itself. People living along their frontiers were perfectly safe. There was panic. There were panicky people living along the frontiers of the Creek Nation that people were fording in. They were afraid. And then when these Mississippi volunteers had launched a, a preemptive attack against a Red Stick supply party at Burncorn Creek, then several Red Stick warriors were killed in that attack. The Creek culture, like the Scott-Irish culture, like others, was very much an eye-for-an-eye eye culture. When that happened, then, yes, there was going to be retaliation. The people in the Tensaw settlement flooded into the stockade. From that point forward, there was a large number of civilians, men, women, and children, crowded into the stockade. Anyone crowded in there was going to get caught in the crossfire at that point. It seems inevitable, then, that civilians on both sides would be caught in the crossfire. Once the Red Sticks were attacked, yes, there were some attacks against civilians, but it went both ways. Also, the Frontier Volunteers and militia attacked Red Stick villages. So, yes, there were civilians on both sides attacked. Was conflict between the Creeks and the Americans inevitable? Not prior to the attack at Burncorn Creek, no. After the attack at Burncorn Creek, yes. So once the Mississippi Volunteers attacked the Red Stick Supply Party at Burncorn Creek, then at that point it was open warfare between the frontier settlers and the Red Sticks, yes. Our story picks up in late August. What happened then was on the morning of August 30th, actually the night before, the Red Stick Army, which numbered somewhere between 500 and 1,000 warriors, approached the Fort Mims area. There were warnings that came into the fort that there was a large Red Stick force in the vicinity. How seriously did the Army take these concerns? Officers in the fort did not place great stock in this. They didn't believe it was possible that there were that many Red Sticks in the vicinity. They went out, they did some scouting in the area. Some of the Red Sticks later reported that they were hiding in woods and ravines and were close enough that they could watch these scouting parties go out and pass right in front of them without seeing them. And they watched them come and go from the fort and then go back into the fort without detecting their presence. They went back into the fort. There were some African-American slaves being held by some of the people in the fort who were sent out, who detected footprints and other things like that of this approaching Red Stick Party. They rushed back into the fort and warned that there were Red Stick warriors in the vicinity. They actually tied these up and were preparing to whip them for spreading a false alarm. One of the men in the fort took his slaves out of the fort rather than allow them to be whipped. Another one, instead of taking his family out of the fort and endangering them, allowed his slaves to be tied up. They were preparing to whip him when the attack took place, and the signal for the attack was they began to sound the lunch bell in the fort. When the lunch bell sounded, that was the signal that the Red Sticks used as their signal for the attack because they knew that everyone in the fort 
would be distracted as they lined up to eat lunch, their midday meal inside the fort. What did they construct the fort out of? They were cut timbers. They were not, like if you visit Fort King today or down at Fort Foster, you see these very sturdy walls. They probably were not as sturdy as you see there. They were split logs, split trees. They dug a trench around. They stood the split logs upright in this trench and then filled in around them. It didn't have a moat around it or anything like that or a dry ditch around it. Because of a mistake in construction, the Creeks were able to exploit a loophole in the stockade's log-hewn defenses. Tell us about that. One mistake they made was they did not cut the loopholes for shooting through high enough, and they didn't put a a firing step around the inside where they could stand up on this firing step and shoot out, which meant that if you were an attacking party, you could literally rush up to the wall of the fort and shoot through these loopholes into the fort just as easily as the people inside could shoot out at you. So when attack took place, the uh, Red State Warriors literally attacked from all four sides at once, and the first thing they did was rush up and gain control of the loopholes and use the walls of the fort for their own purposes as protection for themselves while they fired into the fort. That allowed them as much protection as it did volunteers and the civilian men and the militia inside the fort, and they quickly gained possession of the loopholes The ones that they didn't have enough men to fire through, they used fence posts and stopped those up. And so they were able to use those loopholes for their own use to fire into the fort. And it quickly enabled them to cut down, shoot down many of the men inside the fort and to pin them back into an area behind the men's house where there was a little projection of the fort that they called a bastion. They quickly were able to confine the surviving defenders of the fort back into that area. The main gate of the fort, which was on the east side of the fort and a separate gate on the west side of the fort were open. Two groups of warriors attacked through those gates and were able to storm into parts of the interior of the fort that way. And the blockhouse, which was on the, let me make sure I got this right here, the southwest corner of the fort was not finished, and so parties of Red Stick Warriors stormed that structure and were able to get up on top of the unfinished second floor of the blockhouse and fire down into the fort. And it was sort of like what Southern people would call a turkey shoot at that point. Anyone who showed their face, they were shooting down from that point forward. How does what happened at Fort Mims compare with the Alamo? At Fort Mims, the defenders were caught unawares. But we don't normally think that way for the Alamo. The more recent scholarship about the Alamo is on the final morning they were caught unawares. The Mexican troops were on the walls really before the defenders of the Alamo knew what hit them because Santana had stopped his cannonading that night and they had all fallen asleep. Joe, who was William Barrett Travis's slave, said that they heard a yell that said the Mexicans are on the walls. They all went rushing out to try to fight. By the time they got out there, they were coming over over the walls like sheets. It was Joe's description of what happened. So it was very similar to what happened at the Alamo. It literally was, was a storming of the walls. There's something very similar happened at Fort Mims. Now, the battle for Fort Mims, the final day, that day's battle lasted longer than the final day's battle at the Alamo because once the defenders got in the Mims house and in the bastion area behind it, they held out a lot longer than the defenders of the Alamo did. And so the battle of Fort Mims went on a lot, several hours. It lasted a lot longer. How did Fort Mims compare to other forts of the time, such as Fort Foster or Fort King? If you've ever visited Fort Foster there at Hillsborough River State Park or Fort King, this occupies about that much ground. It is an acre or two there. It's a state historic site in Alabama. Now you can visit the site and it's been partially reconstructed so you can visit it and get a good idea of the amount of ground that the entire fort occupied. But the final battle for Fort Mims and the final standoff took place over a very small area of ground that I would describe about the size of a modern three-bedroom house house where the final the couple of hours of fighting took place. How many people were in the fort? There were in total maybe 
maybe 300 people, 350 people in the fort. Maybe 150 of them were, we say soldiers, but these were citizen soldiers. They were militia and volunteers. Then there were some farmers and frontiersmen with their rifles and muskets. And there were women fighting too at Fort Mims. So you probably had 300, 350 men, women, and children there. And you had somewhere between 500 and 1,000, more likely around 800 or so red sticks involved in the attacking force. Fort Mims could have been properly defended, correct? Yes, as I said, had the gates been closed and had they had their sentries paying close attention, they should have been able to defend the fort, I would think. They were just not prepared for the attack that came. In this case, definitely the better commanders were on the red stick side, without a doubt. What is the confusion in the historical record about who was commanding the Red Stick forces in this battle? That's an interesting question. For many years, and many people believe today that the Red Stick commander was William Weatherford, the Red Eagle. Now, the Red Eagle is a name that didn't come along until a poem was published in the 1850s. William Weatherford was a Red Stick warrior. He was a Matisse who lived in near the Tinsaw Settlement area. However, there was a letter written to the Spanish governor in Pensacola on the day or so after Fort Mims from the leaders of the Red Stick attack. This letter doesn't mention William Weatherford. This letter mentions that the leader of the attack was a Red Stick leader named Patty Walsh. Patty Walsh was a prophet, a Red Stick prophet. He was also a war chief from one of the Red Stick towns uh, up along the Alabama River region in Alabama. And Patty Walsh was a very well-known figure who also was the leader at several other key battles in the Creek War of 1813-1814 and was a well-regarded war chief. Okay, so why does this matter? This throws some controversy into the traditional story of Fort Mims. Another key fact that emerges from this letter is that it also mentions that the prophet Josiah Francis was there at Fort Mims. And this is controversial because a traditional part of the story of Fort Mims, as handed down by many historians through the years, is that Francis was not at Fort Mims. But this letter, written by the leaders of the attack, very specifically says that Francis was there and is signed by Francis. This is a key document because it completely changes what we know about the Red Stick Party that attacked Fort Mims. And so not only does it place Patty Walsh as the leader of the attack on Fort Mims, it also places the leader of the Red Stick movement itself there. We also know that a figure who is well known in Florida, Peter McQueen, who was the great uncle of Osceola, who was the war chief of Tallahassee, was at Fort Mims. So these are some of the key leaders in the Creek Nation at this time and the key leaders of the Red Stick movement, which would make sense if you are going to lead a powerful Red Stick army, you would expect the key war chiefs and the key religious leader of the Red Stick movement to be there, and that's what this letter indicates. The letter is very logical. It's signed by all of these key leaders and others. It's exactly what if you stop and think a minute, logic would dictate, I think the letter is probably exactly what logically you would have expected. It's not what the traditional story of Fort Mims is. I find it fascinating that it does not mention William Weatherford. However, it does make sense with a letter that Benjamin Hawkins wrote shortly after the Battle of Burnt Corn Creek, in which he mentions Weatherford was captured from the Mississippi forces at Burnt Corn Creek. And if the Weatherford he's referring to was William Weatherford, you have to ask yourself, why would they take a prisoner of war, even if he swore allegiance after that battle to the Red Sticks and put him in charge of an attacking force at the next big battle? Who were the American military leaders in this battle? Mm -hmm. Daniel Beasley was there. There were a number of other officers who were present. Many of the people inside Fort Mims were also Creek. They were Matisse or of mixed race descent. The Creek Civil War was in many cases very much a brother against brother, cousin against cousin kind of war. You had brothers on the outside against brothers on the inside, cousins on the outside against cousins on the inside. Many of these families were literally much like the later in Civil War knew each other by sight. There are many stories on both sides handed down in tradition of them yelling out to each other as they saw each other. 
and were fighting against each other in this battle. And that's part of what made this such a blood feud that continued on through the Seminole Wars, is that they really did not like each other because they fought each other. What was the fate of the commander, Major Beasley? Beasley was among the first ones to fall when the attack took place. He rushed to try to close the gate, the main gate of the fort. It had been open so long that Reigns had pushed sand against the main gate of the fort and he couldn't close it and he was cut down early in the fight. And then it was a series of people who tried to organize a defense, but the warriors, probably much like the Dade battle, where warriors were attacking, one would fall, another one would rise, another one would fall, another one would rise, another one would fall. You also had people cornered in different parts of the fort. It was really every little cluster was fighting for them on their own. Dixon Bailey was in the Bastion area, and you had Captain Jack in the Blockhouse area, and you had different people taking charge in different areas, trying to organize a defense, but it was a free-for-all. Once the Red Sticks penetrated the fort, inside the fort, it was a free-for-all. So what was the end result? The end result was that the Red Sticks set fire to the men's house, which formed one side of the little area where the main cluster of defenders were holding out. The heat from that fire and a large group of the survivors were inside the men's house, firing from inside the house. Some of them had knocked the wooden shingles from the roof and were firing out from the roof of the house. Once they got the men's house set ablaze, obviously that the beginning of the end. Dr. Holmes, who was a kind of a frontier doctor who was the surgeon of the militia company there and some others knocked out some of the logs of the wall with an axe and they broke a hole in the wall and started trying to cut their way through using axes and the swinging the butts of their muskets and rifles. Somewhere between 30 and 50 were able to break their way through the clearing around the fort for the woods. Most were wounded. Some 30 to 50 survived it. Others were killed either in the fire or by the bullets or war clubs as they made their way out. The final death toll is known to have been somewhere right around 250 of the men, women, and children in the fort. The Creek took prisoners? They did take prisoners. That's one of the misunderstood things about Fort Mims. They did take a number of prisoners, and the exact number is unknown to this day. We do know that they did take a fairly significant number of women and children prisoners. They took them back with them to the Red Stick Village. A number of them were brought in and turned over to Andrew Jackson after the significant number of Red Sticks surrendered following the defeat of one of the Red Stick armies at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. When Jackson pushed on down to the what became Fort Jackson and sent out word, their surrender or we'll resume our attacks, and quite a few Red Sticks came in and surrendered. Many of them did bring in prisoners from Fort Mims and surrendered them. They also brought in a number of African Americans who had been taken prisoner at Fort Mims and they surrendered them. The story that they did not take prisoners is exactly that, a story, which tells me that many of the women and children who were killed at Fort Mims were killed because they were caught in the crossfire. They were killed as the battle got out of hand, final moment, and were killed in the fire that burned the Mims house. We don't know how many were taken prisoner, but we do know that it was several dozen women and children were taken prisoner. And we know that from Jackson's letters that a number of the African-American slaves who were taken prisoner wound up with him at the Hermitage over the years that followed the Creek War. And efforts were made by various people living along the fringes of the Creek Nation to get them back in the year or so that followed the Creek War. There were a number of prisoners taken immediately as the battle wound down. Were there many survivor accounts of this battle? Not really. There are some who gave some statements later. There are some second-hand accounts from some of them. There are some letters that mention what some of them had to say. There are some statements that reach Benjamin Hawkins from some of them after they made their way and were taken up to the Red Stick Villages in the Creek Nation. There are no published accounts that I'm aware of from any of them, but there are some second-hand statements from some of them that did reach some people who recorded those at the time. 
What became of the survivors who were not captured and taken prisoner by the Creeks? What happened after the battle was some of the survivors began to make their way over to Mount Vernon, Alabama, and Fort Stoddard, and began to make their way in with news of it. This is across the Alabama River from where four men stood. The people over there could see the smoke rising from the fort. They knew there had been a disaster. The word began to filter out that Mims Fort had fallen. The Red Sticks themselves make their way back up to Econochaka, or the Holy ground with news of defeat. Also, word reaches Hawkins, who is over in Georgia, that Men's Station has fallen. This word reaches Tennessee, it reaches Georgia, it reaches the Mississippi Territory. No one believes that the Creeks are capable of taking a fortified position, but they have. The number killed has greatly inflated. It goes up to like 550 almost immediately, even though the burial party that reaches the fort finds only 200 and I think 47 bodies. Armies are raised to invade the Creek Nation. This leads to three armies invading the Creek Nation, one from Georgia, one from the Mississippi Territory, and one from Tennessee. All three are initially turned back. It takes a winter and a spring of warfare before Jackson finally reaches Horseshoe Bend. How is the battle at Fort Mims different from the Dade battle? There are very different types of battles because the Dade battle is entirely an attack on a U.S. military column. It's an attack on open ground against a military column that is marching along a road. Different because this is an attack on a fortified position. More comparable would have been if they had attacked and taken Fort King or Fort Brooke at the beginning of the Seminole Wars. How great a defeat was this for the Army? This was a major defeat. It was not against U.S. troops, but it was a major defeat for U.S. frontiersmen. Absolutely. Dale, we've talked about some of the accounts of the battle. What does the archaeology tell us? The archaeology is telling us more with each passing year. The remains of the fort have been found. The remains of the men's house have been found. In fact, at the reenactment, which is coming up, people will be able to visit the museum. They display artifacts from the archaeological project. And on the weekend of the reenactment each year, people can see those. And you see literally melted balls and artifacts that have come from the remains of the fort. There are a couple of published archaeological reports. You learn a lot about how the fort was designed and built and all of that. And the site is preserved now as a park. People can visit that. You can see reconstructions of part of the fort based on the archaeology and, and things like that. I understand it's not just archaeology that is revealing secrets about this battle. Every year we are learning more about the written record of the fort and the written record of the battle. In my own research from Spanish archives and from you know, the archives and from the National Archives of Great Britain, found tremendous amounts of written material about the attack on Fort Mims that had been previously unpublished. Other researchers are doing the same. It's telling us amazing amounts of new information about this battle, particularly from the Native American side of things. It is open our eyes to new facts about this battle, as I mentioned, about who was leading the attack, that the prophet Patty Walsh was there, that the prophet Josiah Francis was there, that perhaps people that we thought were in charge may not have been in charge, that there were white deerskin traders taking part on the red stick side of the attack. That's something that most people don't know about it, because they were married into these red stick families, and they went with their sons to the battle, that there were many, many, many well-known families who live in the Muscogee Creek Nation or in the Porch Band of Creeks today and in the Seminole Nation and in the Miccosukee tribes today who are well-known families who were part of Fort Mims and in the relationship that it had to the Seminole Wars. It really was all one war. It, it really was a war that started in 1812 that continued to 1858. Has archaeology and these previously unseen records changed our understanding of the battle greatly? In some cases, they confirm, and in some cases, they redefine. For example, some of the documents tell us that this remained an active military site on up into the First Seminole War, and that's something that was not known. But we are finding new documents that indicate to us that during the First Seminole War, this was a military campsite, and that Fort Mims, parts of the fort survived. 
Jackson camp there prior to his occupation of Pensacola in 1814. Fort Mims remained an active military site later by the U.S. military during the War of 1812 and then on into the First Seminole War, even though the fort itself was not rebuilt. Davy Crockett describes camping there in his autobiography and meeting people there who survived the attack. It was an important landmark for many years to come, but many of the Lieutenant Colonel Edward Nichols, who led the British descent on the Gulf Coast of Florida during the War of 1812, talks about meeting many warriors and maroon fighters who were involved in the Battle of Fort Mims. And he describes in his letters to the admirals of the British fleet his discussions with them about what happened at Fort Mims. There's a lot of documentation out there about this battle that, because it was something of interest, the, the British wanted to know how these Red Stick warriors managed to take this fort. It was of interest all the way up to the high admirals of the British fleet. There's a lot of correspondence that was going around at the time of the Battle of New Orleans about Fort Mims, and those are things that we didn't know. Peter McQueen's there, and he figures all the way on up into it. And then, of course, his grandnephew, Osceola, was a young man at the time of this battle. He would have grown up hearing stories about this from his great uncle. For those who'd like a hands-on experience seeing Fort Mims, as fortune has it, there is a living history event, a reenactment about the Battle of Fort Mims at the end of this month, 29 and 30 August. Dale, tell us about it. The reenactment takes place on Saturday and Sunday. It will be at the site, which is at Fort Mims State Historic Site, and people can Google that and look it up. They can find it, or, or they can go to fortmims.org, the nonprofit site that supports the State Historic Site. Fort Mims State Historic Site is in Tensaw, Alabama. That's spelled T-E-N-S-A-W, just like it sounds. It's just north of Mobile, Alabama. It's also near Spanish Fort, Alabama. It's a historic area. It's a beautiful area of the state. Just north of I-65, that's where the reconstructed fort is located. If you look up Fort Mims, you'll find it. They have off-site parking, and they have shuttles that run to the fort, so there's plenty of parking. You can catch the shuttle, and you can ride to the fort site, and the shuttles run constantly. It's easy to get to. They have food on site. They have food trucks and all the typical stuff like that. Throughout the day, they will be having living history, all of those kinds of things. They have historical lectures by different authors and things like that through the day. In the morning, they do the reenactment of the Battle of Burnt Corn Creek. And in the afternoon, they do the Battle of Fort Mims at a reconstructed fort. The spectacle of the battle doesn't last as long as the actual battle, does it? They last about 30 minutes. We encourage everyone to come prepared for it to be hot. It is usually very hot and very humid there. It's swampy terrain, so keep that in mind. So come prepared for very hot, very humid conditions. Prepare to stay hydrated. Our listeners will be pleased to know, Dale, that you're part of the reenactment as well. What part do you play? Yeah, I take part in Greek War reenacting. One of my ancestors was a red stick, and so I take part on the red stick side. Uh, have for a number of years now. Do my best to take out as many of them as I can. And your Two Egg Productions business partner, Rachel Conrad, also takes part. She's joined me for an episode on Millie Francis, the daughter of the Creek prophet, Josiah Francis, and we'll run that at a later date. Mm -hmm. Rachel will tell what life was like for Creek women of that time period and tell stories for the young folks who come as part of what she does. Although she won't be portraying Millie Francis at the Battle of Fort Mims, she will at the Pioneer Museum in Dade City come December, and we'll have more information about that as we get closer. She will tell the story of Millie Francis in the first person, and the kids and young teens and loves to explain what life was like. I've seen her do it and keeps kids spellbound. They really seem to enjoy it too. But there's more to the day's outing than just the battle reenactments. Yeah, they do demonstrations ranging uh, from white oak basket weaving to blacksmithing to weaponry. They do a wide variety of demonstrations. The typical type thing you see at these types of events, they do all of those. It's all early 19th century demonstrations. Very authentic. This is an event that has come a long way. They tell me back when they first started this, it was like watching an old John Wayne movie, war bonnets and everything else. Come a long way from then. It's very authentic now. They work hard to present authentic reenactment now. And all the money they raise goes into the Memorial Association that you know, works on maintaining the reconstructed fort and maintaining the historic site. Had a rough couple of years both obviously because of COVID, but also because of the site's been hit by a couple of hurricanes and tropical storms over the last couple of years that did a lot of damage. 
in terms of the reconstructed fort, but also trees and things like that were knocked down at the site. And so all of that's been cleaned up with money that was raised by this association. Is this a national park or a state park? Who owns Fort Mims? The fort belongs to the state of Alabama. It is a state historic site, but most of the money for its upkeep and maintenance is raised by this association. Where do you go to find out more? FortMims.org. All right, that wraps it up. Dale Cox, thanks for joining us for The Seminole Wars. I have enjoyed it. If you enjoyed this show, please take a moment to like us on Facebook at Seminole Wars Foundation. Leave a review on iTunes or your favorite podcast provider. Your reviews and comments help new listeners discover us and help us keep the show going. Visit our website at www.seminolewars.us for blogs, articles, news, books, events, membership information, and how to subscribe to this podcast. We'll be back soon with a new episode of the Seminole Wars Podcast. The Seminole Wars Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to preservation, education, and publication of Seminole Wars history throughout the state of Florida. This podcast is copyrighted, the Seminole Wars Foundation 2021, all rights reserved. Front bumper music, The Devil's Garden, Roast em, provided by kind permission of Rita Youngman. Back bumper music, Second Seminole Win, by Jed Merrim and Ricky Pittman, courtesy of Ricky Pittman, all rights reserved.